Her beautiful paintings have also been used in various ways. Posters for Harbor Fest in Norfolk and Hamptons Bay Days. You can also find her paintings in numerous public locations, including the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters in Norfolk and Harbor Bank in Newport News. What I love about Gloria is she's no stranger to Thomas Nelson. She actually took classes here a while ago, and she served as a member of our Fine Arts Advisory Board um, for over 12 years. She's a very big supporter of our visual arts department. On Wednesday of this week, she will be conducting a workshop for all art students. And that workshop is, I believe, is entitled After Art School What? Talking about professional practices and marketing yourself as an artist. The workshop is going to be held in room 107, the drawing studio, um, from 3.30 to 5.20 during Jackie Merritt's, I think that's drawing three and four class, Jackie, is that right? But it's open to all art students, so take advantage of that. Many of you had the opportunity to speak with Gloria, and you know she has an awful lot to offer. Um, and she's always thrilled to work with students. So if you don't have a class, or maybe if you do have a class and you get your instructor to take you over there Wednesday from 3.30 to 5.20, I think you're going to find it very valuable. So I'm actually going to introduce her now and let her talk about her process and her, her, her work. Gloria Coker. Psychology, I didn't know at the time, because I chose it because I loved the coursework. I loved the liberal arts program and the, the choices that I had. But I didn't know that when you get a degree in psychology, you can't do anything with it unless you have advanced degrees. Yes. I was fortunate enough to work for an electrical company, and that's where I met my husband. And then after that, wandered down to Houston, Texas, where I didn't do any drawing or anything, but I worked as a psychiatric social worker and then went to a little bit north again, and then I came to, uh, to Newport News. How did we get here? I'm from Connecticut, Connecticut Yankee, New York Southern, South Carolina. So we drew a line and we bisected it. Then we came out to Newport News and we thought, oh wow, Newport News is on the water. This is great. We didn't know that there were a whole lot of beaches in Newport News, but, but here we are. So anyway, the first picture that I want to show you is uh, from the newsroom series that I did. It wasn't a series, it was a courtroom art. And uh, I think you can see pretty easily that I was deep, deeply involved in doing black and white illustrations. Now, when you are doing work for the newspaper, first of all, you have a deadline, which you who are in commercial art will always have a deadline. And I, uh, I came in as a total novice. I mean, they hired me because uh, they thought I was going to be able to enhance the newspaper and do probably maps, charts, and graphs, and logos. And I didn't even know what a logo was. So I was totally new, no computers, no iPhones, nothing like that. And the first thing they did was to give me about uh, illustration stories. So I would work for the newsroom and for features department. Well, the courtroom art is fascinating to a lot of people, and it was to me too, because I wandered into the courtroom, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no clue. How do you draw? There are no courses, there are no guidelines. You just know that you have to have some kind of pencil and paper. That's it. And I'd go into the courtroom, and I would find a place to sit that would give me some kind of a view of the people who were there, including the defendant. But he usually would have his back turned to me, and he'd be very quiet looking down. And, and then the, the lawyers, um, I'd have to see the lawyers, because I would do the lawyers and the judges and the, uh, the jurors. So one of the things that I think is pretty fascinating is that from an artistic point of view, when you're doing a person in motion who is not posing for you, they're not sitting there for you, everybody, I don't know whether I can move here or not to show you what I'm talking about, but everybody, can you hear me without my, without that thing? Okay. If, I, if I'm a lawyer and I'm going to talk about uh, the jury, the jury and, and this is the way I usually stand, okay, I start drawing. I have my paper and my pencil, 
and I start drawing. Inevitably, a few seconds later, that person would wander on over, and he'd go to the other side, right? So I'd flip my page over, and I'd start another pose that this person probably did all the time. Whatever, right? People have their, their, their poses. Okay? And then he go back again to the same pose, you know, whatever it might be. And I flip back. But I have to do it very quietly because you can't interfere with the legal process and make any noise. When Betty Wells and some of the other people who worked for the New York uh, broadcast services, some of them would use magic markers. And the, the security staff would say, you're not using magic markers, are you? What's that all about? They go, <laughs> no, I'm just using the charcoal and the pencil, you know. And then if I needed to do color, then I would go to my office. Is that a plan? Yeah. I would go to my office in the ladies' room, and I would call out my color, and I would uh, finish my job there, and then finish back up. This is a, uh, well, let me go back a second, okay. You may not have heard, you may not have heard of uh, the John Walker spy trial, but he was arrested and charged with espionage. And he was a Navy man, and he was tried in federal, he was tried in federal court, but he had a brother named Arthur. Arthur Walker was charged and tried in federal court in Norfolk, and I was the one that went down there. This was probably my biggest trial. And I walked in the first day, and there's the man sitting there. And I don't know who he is, you know. I'm just going there to do my job, and I have an idea where he is. And he's got a full head of hair. And, okay, so I draw him. There he is with his full head of hair. Next day I come in, he's got no hair at all. <laughs> and <laughs> is this the same man, you know? And, and I'm, I'm sitting there, and I don't have anybody to talk to about all of this. I'm just, I'm just doing the artwork, and I have to find my place and all the New York people are up there, and I'm sitting on the aisle, and I'm trying to be inconspicuous and all. But we got, I got through that, and I got through a lot of other ones, and then this one is, um, the, these are several pictures here. The one in color um, with the boy, uh, the young man, uh, that was the Ripper trial. They would only send me when it was a really gory or very, very uh, human interest kind of a trial. And apparently the man that this fellow murdered um, had, a, had the nickname of the Ripper because of the things that he did. And, and this fellow uh, was being tried for his murder and was asked, uh, oh, the thing that, that drew me to the trial was that uh, he unfortunately uh, murdered the guy and then cut him in half. And, and this was a very disgusting thing for people to, to see or hear about. And, but, but the kind of like dark humor funny thing about it was that when they asked him, you know, how tall was this man? Um, and well, suitcase was about this big. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> but, uh, but I would, I would be sitting there trying to listen at the same time I'm trying to do this job. We all know how hard art is to do, especially when you're doing people and they have to be recognized, right? So anyway, and the other one where the man is holding his hands up like this, that was a Dr. Levine who was told to come, uh, hired to come from New York to do a uh, expert, expert witness um, on teeth fight marks because the, the, the perpetrator of the crime uh, had bit the person that he, that he killed on, on the thigh. And this was being analyzed and that's how he was convicted. I don't think they do that anymore. I don't think it's, it's uh, legal. <clears throat> anyway, um, moving on to the, uh, the picture on the right, on the right I guess, uh, 
police officers would occasionally ask me to come and do some drawings based on witness testimony of what people look like. And uh, that particular gentleman, Derek Peterson, he was arrested on the basis, uh, I like to think, of the drawing that I did from four witnesses uh, who watched him actually murder their boss at a grocery store. So I'm doing this drawing based on these kids sitting there telling me, giving me description. And uh, this, it is one of, the, one of the ones that, if you can see from the mugshot, looks a lot like them. And the police told me that they knew who exactly it was based on my, my drawing, which I thought was, that was a pretty wonderful thing to hear. They were able to uh, have somebody arrested who uh, had done a terrible thing. Um, and then he was arrested and he was getting that throttle. And then a little bit later, he and five other guys escaped. So uh, uh, the people in Hampton, they beat feet out of there for, for the weekend because nobody knew where these, where these guys were. So I, I didn't have my signature on it, so uh, it didn't really bother me all that much. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, OK. Um, when I did work for the uh, newspaper's uh, illustration, as an illustration, I, um, I had the opportunity to do a lot of things that were culturally oriented, uh, socially oriented, and the violin was my interpretation of how you do, um, how, how you illustrate a story that is about how one side of your world, being South Side, what, how that cultural, the cultural events are going to be tried to come, come to the peninsula. Okay? So how do you say that you know, this is happening? And um, I thought, well, we'll, we'll take the violin of the Virginia Symphony and we'll cross Hampton Roads with it. And the other one was, uh, it's an obvious thing, a story on how to be, and why we, we are, we're rude to each other. So those are two people sticking their tongues out. Okay. Um, now, OK. Um, the women, okay, um, being a feminist uh, in that day and age, which was the late 70s, early 80s, mid 80s, um, was um, interesting here in uh, our very conservative Virginia. And I, uh, I thought that the way that we accept a lot of things is when we see people actually doing them. And at that time, uh, there were very, very few women professional people. They were in a, really in a minority. So I, I thought that, that my job might be to convey what I thought uh, you know, the world should look like. So I would make minorities and women, because that was my really my big thing. Uh, the, the picture on, on the right, the image of the screen, okay, that uh, was my interpretation of how you go to a rock concert and have your hearing damage. And I chose Edvard Mook's The Screen. Okay. Um, just another example of uh, business of art, political art, that sort of thing. And the next one is the um, my conception of short-term versus long-term goals. And at that point, the Japanese seemed to be very long-term, and he seemed to be very short-term in that thinking. So I thought the pot at the end of the rainbow might work. Oh, that's just another picture of me and an art show. I'm not there, but that's my concept of it. <laughs> and, uh, and there you have my daughter, who always posed for me as my son and my husband. And it was, a, it was kind of an interesting thing to be able to go home and get your kids to sit for you. Uh, because who else is going to do that? You can make them. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I do uh, an interesting case like for gay marriage, uh, 1985 or so, think about it. Gay marriage was really something you could talk about, you could think about, and we did a story about it. But how do you illustrate that? So my idea was to take two men's hands and have them holding hands with a, with a wedding ring on one of them. And nobody would pose for me. I can't imagine why. But nobody would pose for me at the newspaper. So what I did was I, I went to the director, the head of the photography department, and I said, Jim, I, I need to get some information here. I can't draw it from my head. And so we looked around, grabbed the, the, the closest guy walking by and said, here, 
is this okay? And then I, I, I spent like a few minutes just, you know, just going crazy drawing with the hands together, and, and, it, and it kind of worked out. Okay. Um, caricatures and, and people who are in the news, I hope you can identify some of these people. Um, Bruce Hornsby, Oprah, Bob Dylan, Diana Ross. That's another world entirely of, of art. And uh, this one was uh, is in the show and is Ella Fitzgerald. One picture that I did that is recently on the cover of that um, cooking uh, book, uh, Dining Room with the Stars. Okay, just another picture of my recent, more recent work. And violins, I painted violins for the Virginia Symphony to raise money for, for auction, at the auction. But um, this is the picture uh, that is in the show of uh, Joanne Folletta conducting the Virginia Symphony. And uh, the way I got to meet her was I decided to do a series on women of accomplishment in traditionally men's jobs. And I chose her because she was uh, one of the first women conductors that I had heard of, and she was right there with Virginia Symphony. So I called up Virginia Symphony, of course, they blessed me off, and I called back, about the same thing. And I finally, they said, okay, we'll give the message to Joanne. And she called me that night from Long Beach and said, hey, fine, that'd be cool. So she let me sit on stage with her conducting the rehearsal of the Bruckner Ford at Chrysler. And there I am, surrounded by this wonderful, wonderful music. And, uh, and I, can't, I can't take any flash, I don't have a digital camera, so everything is blurred, and I can't move. I can't move around. I'm stationary. So everything I got was whatever I could point and shoot with my 35 millimeter. And of course, I took so many pictures, so many classes here, Thomas Nelson and I, I was pretty familiar with the 35 millimeter camera. Um, so, so that was the way I got to do a lot of the Virginia Symphony, and I did their work for about four years. They used their work for publicity. Okay. Um, early work, very, very dark, burnt umber, Payne's gray, um, not very vibrant, but kind of liked it. It was Bessie Smith. I guess a picture that I had taken a photograph of a, an old Santa Fe railroad car. And then just more work that reflects more of the way I do my work now. And then this one, I, I kind of liked it, kind of liked it, but it was kind of boring to me. So I decided to paint over it, so I did that. I, I liked it a whole lot better. I had more movement and everything. That's why sometimes we go over our, our own art. Another more recent picture. This is one where, this is a sketch, and I painted it. I was kind of getting a little bit happy with it. And then I noticed, what's up in the upper right hand corner? A stall. Did I put it there deliberately? No. <laughs> I put it there and it happened there and, and that's a good reason to get people to kind of double check your art. Uh, in one courtroom session, I drew a judge and a picture of him appeared above the fold front page and he had six fingers. <laughs> Everybody saw that. Everybody saw that, and I heard about it. So. Now, um, sometimes when you're an artist, you, you're a little bit down, a little bit depressed, and I'm uh, no different from anybody else. Put on Mozart's Requiem and paint to a uh, you know picture of a very sad-looking woman, uh, dull kind of colors, neutral colors, and then obviously I have to line myself up a bit, get myself out of the stupor. So I, oh dear. <laughs> Holding like hundred-year-old lace, and then I had to do 
portrait work. So I went down to Turbicle, South Carolina, and it was Kathleen and they pig pen. And they had a farm, and I, um, I said, can I take your picture? They said, fine, let's walk outside. And I'm um, thinking, you know, I've got to do something more than two people standing next to each other, like American Gothic. I was hoping, when I said, can you find a prop? I was hoping he wouldn't grab a pitchfork. And he did not. He turned around, it was a table piled with American flags. And he grabbed the American flag, wrapped his arm around his wife, and, and said, will this do? And I said, are you kidding me? I love it. And this, um, this painting pretty much reflects exactly what the photo looked like. Okay. When you do dancers, as I do a lot of dancers, very romantic, everybody seems to love dancers. But one thing you have to remember is when you do a lot of dancers and you get a reputation for them, and you've done hundreds, whatever, and then you slit your wrists before you do another one, and that's when people finally realize that you're alive, you're doing dancers, and hey, hey where, can I see the next dancer series? I don't, I don't want to do another dancer series. I don't want to do another dancer series. I'm tired of this. I want to do something else. But you do get caught up in the marketplace and what sells. So you got to watch that. Art students got to watch that kind of thing. Um, I do do landscapes, and sometimes I try to put women in them. And you may see um, as many as I put in them. Um, some men see 11. There are not 11 women there. <laughs> They're not. I think there are only seven, but everybody sees uh, a different body count. I love doing pictures of caves early on uh, with texture and the bison and the animals and everything. I thought this was really, really cool. Uh, it takes me back to uh, the caves of Lascaux. I've never been there, but it takes me back there anyway. <laughs> and I would do these thinking that, okay, who were in the caves? Women, right? So why wouldn't they be the artists? Just my concept, based on nothing but my own feeling. So I did this. And then I did another picture, and um, Probably can't see it, but the back of her head, the time that is uh, kind of yellowish and orangish, that's the butt end of a bison. And I decided I didn't like it, so I painted over it and I made a woman. Now, this is kind of an unusual picture because her face is blue. Blue is supposed to be seen, reds and warm colors approach. And there are some people that cannot see her face. I find it very, very strange, but. People see a lot of things in my work that I wouldn't put there, so I can accept anything. And then if you want to get contemporary, I mean, here's your iPhone in a cave, okay? And then, so I call it circa, you know, archaeology, circa 2016. Now, I do do boats. Some people ask me if I do, I do them, and this is the way I prefer to. Do cyclists, go to the Virginia Living Museum, and paint for the kids, where I do owls and turtles. And there's a grandson. He's very old now, so that's a long, old picture. And there's a picture, in it, and we, we sometimes get a chance to do art for restaurants and that sort of thing, so jump at it. Sell it to them, though. Don't, don't give it to them. Don't let them just hang it and get all greasy and all. And you do books covers, and maybe even a large picture of the USS Units, uh, Newport News. Did that for a bank, and they proceeded to make a lot of prints for the Navy. They made 43 prints, which had 43 schools in Newport News. And even in a Zooms, <laughs> then <there's> a <laughs> My husband went into the restroom, and he says, you're not going to believe this story. And I said, well, I'm not going in there, but you were going to be the picture of it. So there I am. It's my work, the urinal, and Barkley Cheeks. So. <laughs> so we sometimes get a chance to do a wine label, which is kind of cool. And then my, from my photography years, uh, I love this picture of the, uh, the wrestlers. I, I don't think I'd ever duplicate that picture, and that's because there was no flash, no stop action, no nothing. It was just happenstance. It just happened. And then a pose image that I kind of thought was sentimental. Also my daughter, who's here by the way, she's a fan. 
That's it. I'm sorry. To say that. Expensive, glass 
drinking. My husband saying, don't do any more watercolor. You know, please don't. I don't want to even carry that stuff around. So I, I managed to have the opportunity to take a picture that I had done and just throw all flush into the winds, throw it into the winds. It was a horrible picture. It was a picture of a little boy. And I got, I got out my ink, I got out my pencils, I got out my acrylics, I got out everything, and just started to paint over it. It was one of the best things I did because I no longer had that, um, you have to paint uh, with leaving the white of the paper, and you can't do anything without making it muddy and all that kind of stuff that you learn when you're doing traditional watercolor. So, but that, yes? Do you visit the Living Museum on a regular basis? Okay, do you visit the Living Museum on a regular basis? Yes. Yes. I haven't gone for a couple of weeks because I've been busy with this, but uh, I go once a week for two hours and I paint for the kids and, and the visitors who was ever there. They, I told them when I got there, I said I'm going to be a volunteer, but I'm going to do it on my terms. I come, I haul out my stuff, I set it up, I paint pictures, I talk to anybody who wants to talk to me, and then I come home. I clean up after myself. Are you going to be there at the Reptiles Alive event they're having in March? I haven't even seen anything. Any, I haven't even seen the dinosaurs in it. And it hasn't, I think I'd like to go and see that. But usually if there's an event, they'll tell me about it and they'll say, you know, do you want to come? But um, I don't know. Well, I'd like to see you there. Huh? You saw the dinosaurs in me? No, no, no. Talk about the outsourced outdoor <laughs> dinosaurs. <laughs> Okay, that's my granddaughter. She doesn't <laughs> She's laughing at pictures. <laughs> no, but I find that, it, you know, when you teach somebody to do something, it really reinforces you. you. You learn so much when you teach somebody. And I love teaching other people. But I don't want to teach a class where I have to grade. And when you go to the Living Museum and you're teaching there and you're, you're telling these little kids, okay, when I put blue together with yellow, what am I going to get, you know? And if they see green for the first time, right? And red and purple and then, oh yeah, let's, let's, let's have everything going in this direction and then coming back and going in that direction. Yeah. And they've never been exposed to this. And I'm saying, take your pictures, go home, have your mom print them out, and then you paint on them. Paint on them. Tear them up, do stuff with them. It's your own work, right? It's your own for photography. You can do whatever you want with it, right? So, and these kids are like, no, I can really do that? Can I really do that? Is that fair? Is that legal? <laughs> yes, it's legal. Yes, it's okay. But if you can inspire one kid to go home and, and get out his tools and start drawing and say, you know, you're an artist, you're never going to be here. You always have your, your pencil and your paper, and you can do anything you want to do. You don't need other people. So, did I? Um, I exhibit animals with reptiles live shows for little kids. Oh, you do? Yeah, you actually have the reptiles? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. I free geckos. So, I, I okay. really completely and totally and understand tomorrow. what you're saying about talking to the kids about the things that you love. There really is nothing more beautiful than that. Yeah, you know? yeah. I, I, I was talking to a homeschool group and um, this, I, was, I had koi fish, not koi are not Virginia fish, but I had little commissions so like other, other piggies fish. And I'm paying these swirls and these fish are going here and that, and I'm telling this kid and some of the younger members of this family, and say, you know, the, the, the job of the artist is to keep the person, you know, interested. Get, get them excited about the picture, get them in there, and then have them wander around, and the last thing you want is for that fish to swim out of the canvas, right? Mm -hmm. and, you know, you never know what's coming. What's happening? You know, what's getting through? So um, I get home that night and I get an email from the mom or the, whoever was the chaperone. Says, you have no idea, but this kid who never said a word all the way home could talk about nothing else but keeping the eye inside the picture. I'm thinking, whoa! Now he's going to go and he's going to look at other pictures and he's going to say, does that work? Does that not work? And how can I do it better or work? So it's like. You know, you don't have to have a teaching degree. All you have to do, and then I tell the kids, you can teach yourself on YouTube. There are millions of two-minute, five-minute segments on YouTube. You want to learn how to sketch animals? YouTube. <laughs> She's going to be hired.
worry about it if he presses it. <laughs> <laughs> there she goes. Anybody else have anything you want to know about me? Play my mother. Huh? Play my mother. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. I, I've enjoyed your, your art in the, in the Daily Press over the year. I was just wondering, have you ever uh, considered compiling it into a book? You know, that, a book? you know, everybody says that. They all say, why don't you get it, get it all together and all that, but I'm thinking, work, work, work. <laughs> I don't have the energy of time the desire, you know? But if somebody, you know, I would hire somebody to put it all together in a book, I think that would be fun. I could even do it on a shorter film, right? But I, I, you know, at this point in my life, I'd like somebody else to take the reins and say, okay, you're going to put this in here. This one, no, not so much, you know? The decisions are hard. Me sitting in my attic and using my boxes of stuff for this presentation, I mean, it was wonderful. I enjoyed it, but it was tiring, too. So, I don't want to get too tired.